So keep that in mind, Jesus, others, and yourself. I want your opinion, please. Don't speak out loud. What's your thoughts? Should Christians go to taverns with non-Christians? What do you think? I mean, go and have a beer, too, with a non-Christian? Should you enter into a tavern or a bar with a non-Christian? Or maybe sometimes some things that aren't the best happen? What do you think? Should a pastor go to Las Vegas for vacation? Well, you know what? Stays in Vegas. I mean, what happens in Vegas what? I saw someone in t- with a T-shirt here in Defiance to say, what happens in Vegas happens here, okay? Should a pastor uh, go to Las Vegas for a vacation? What do you think? And could a church or school have a fundraiser at a hotel of a large gambling boat? You know, the gambling boats are usually on a lake and the river, and then there's usually this really big hotel, and you get, you know, rent the facility pretty cheap. You do a fundraiser there, like maybe an auction, should it? I've seen some heads, people not sure. Uh, previous sermons, uh, services, somebody's shaking their head. What do you think? What do you think about this? Should a pastor eat with Islamic students after sunset observing Ramadan? Well, Ramadan is a, uh, is a, is a holy day in Islam, and, and Muslims will fast for a month in the evening and they get to eat. And uh, a pastor is invited to go eat with them. They fast all day, something went down. Pastor, should a pastor be able to go and eat with Muslim students during Ramadan? What's your opinion? What do you think of a Christian on vacation entering into a, a Mayan pagan temple with a tour group? And there you could see the religious ceremonies of the pagans and the Mayans. Should a pastor go in there and be part of that? What do you think? And finally, should Christians purchase and eat meat sacrificed to idols? You know, if somebody has an idol and they sacrifice the meat and eat to it. I was going to say, should a pastor or should a Christian be a Pittsburgh Steeler fan? Because the Bible says, thou shalt not be a Steeler. I didn't know how I'd feel about that. Yeah, but anyways. Or be a Browns fan. I've seen some Steeler fans. I couldn't resist it, okay? I, you guys give me one. I, I want, okay? All right, so um, what do you think? I saw some uh, heads move around. And by the way, uh, all those, in one way or another, pertain to me. Now, we'll get to that later. <gasps> okay. Right, get to that later, okay? What we know for sure, so let me go ahead and answer that question and give you some background. What we know for sure as, as believers is that, um, is that idols are gods not found in the Bible. An idol is nothing more than figments of imaginations. Uh, do you have an idol? Well, anything that you and I love and trust above God is an idol. Matter of fact, where we put our hope and trust is, our, is an idol besides God. So idols are nothing. Do we know that for sure? What else do we know? Well, we also know for sure uh, that we're called to primary allegiance to one greater than Moses, and that's Jesus Christ. That's from today's Old Testament lesson. And then what we also know for sure, there's only one true and living Lord. That's what the demon said correctly. That's in today's gospel. So we know for sure idols are nothing. We know for sure that there's only one God who we have allegiance to, and we know that we have freedoms. Yeah, you have freedoms as Christians. Uh, there's really nothing wrong with having a beer or going to a ball game having a beer. Uh, there's really nothing wrong even walking to an establishment that has uh, gambling slot machines. It was that way in, in Illinois. Or in Nevada, same thing. We Christian have freedoms. There's nothing wrong with going to a liquor store and buying some liquor. There's, there's nothing sinful about that. We have freedoms. And what else do we know? Well, we're called to what? Can you read that by verse? We as Christians are called to what? Idols don't exist. Um, we have freedoms. There's one God, and we're to love one another. And so riddle me this. I want you to go back in time with me for 2,000 years. And um, matter of fact, the city of Corinth isn't, isn't so much unlike uh, what American cities are like now. But in the city of Corinth, uh, they had fancy restaurants. And in those fancy restaurants, it was surrounded by idols. And they cooked meat, and, and the meat was then sacrifice and dedicate to these idols. It was a really nice restaurant, really the big restaurant in town, and it was a place where you'd go and maybe your, 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 your nephew got engaged and have an engagement party, or, or your brother's having your, a 50th birthday party, and that's where you'd go and celebrate, or, or maybe you're going to propose to your wife to be, and that's where you take her, or, or, or maybe uh, your company is having a meal plan, uh, a planning meal there, and that's where you go, or, or maybe I do business, I sell products, and I bring my uh, future customers there. Should a Christian participate in that? And and the other thing is that that you and I take for granted 
is you ate meat, and meat is a rare delicacy. Um, I was in Costco yesterday, and I got three meat samples for free. I was coming back from seeing my dad. Uh, our church, my previous church, did missionary work in Uganda. And people in Uganda, if, if they're blessed, they have meat one time a month. And many of them only have meat one time a year. But, but for missionaries to go there, because our diet's so used to it, they make sure that missionaries have meat one time a day. So the question is, in Corinth, in this fancy restaurant where people do business transactions and do family events and other important things, is it wrong for Christians to go and eat there when the meat's being sacrificed and drinks are being sacrificed and dedicated to these pagan idols? And so that's your question. Go ahead. Just read with me silently. Can a Christian there enjoy friendships, accept invitations, build business transactions, and delight in rare, delicate meal with meat at temples, with meat or drink offered to idols? What do you think? But should a pastor go to Vegas? Should you go into a tavern and have a bar with a non-Christian? Should you eat with Muslims after sunset during Ramadan? What do you think? What's a Christian to do? Well, what are we to do with that? Well, let me give you some more background. We as Christians, uh, we have rights. Can you all read that? For freedom. For us believers, we're redeemed from, from sin, and, and the law no longer applies to me. We have freedom. If I want to go to a Browns game and pay $16 for a Coors Light, I can't, okay? Matter of fact, uh, I hear that they're still selling alcohol at theaters. There's nothing wrong with that. We went to a theater in Colorado, and they were selling drinks there. There's nothing wrong for a Christian to go and to do that or have a beer at a ball game. There, there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, there's really nothing wrong with Las Vegas. I know it sounds odd, but there's, there's this huge Lutheran school there with 800 kids in Las Vegas. Matter of fact, there's nothing wrong with living there. Uh, we have freedoms. We can do as we wish. Uh, matter of fact, God made everything. We have freedoms. Well, what else? We're called to be a witness to love each other as Christ had loved us. That, so we're called to have freedoms. We're also called to love each other. And also, so what are we to do? What are we to do with that restaurant with the pagan idols and the meat sacrificed and Vegas and taverns and fundraisers at gambling boats? What are we to do? Well, um, what are we to do? Well, enjoy Christian freedom. Then decipher between being among idols and flirting and being influenced by idols. So two years ago, um, my wife and I, my daughter, granddaughter, and son-in-law, we went to uh, Cozumel. And we did the, ready? We did the chocolate tequila tour, okay? I didn't have any tequila, okay? So I'm just kidding. Um, and then we went to a Mayan village where they had a Mayan temple. We went inside it. And the person says, we're not going to do a religious ceremony. He said, but, but this isn't real. And so I did say a prayer for God to close my ears and for me not to hear, my soul to hear. Now, the difference, I was in that Mayan temple, but I wasn't going to allow the law to influence me. There's a difference between being among idols and flirting and being influenced by idols. Let me explain a little further. Uh, before I became a pastor, I was a parish DCE, and once in a while, a high schooler would come up to me and say, Kurt, I'm hanging out with these three friends that get in trouble. Can I hang out with them? I said, well, answer me this. When you go out with them, are you more like them and get in trouble, or are they more like you and don't get in trouble? Now, if you're more like them and get in trouble, then guess what? They're influencing you. Don't do it. But if they're more like you, then you're being godly influence in what? Then go out with them. You know, Jesus says this, don't be equally yoked with unbelievers. You can hang out with unbelievers, just don't buy into everything they say. Or better yet, didn't Jesus eat with publicans and tax collectors and prostitutes and Pittsburgh Steelers fans and Cleveland Browns fans, Detroit Lions fans and Republicans and Democrats and Independents? Didn't he do that? It wasn't a big deal for them because they weren't going to influence them. He came to influence them. So there's nothing, idols are nothing, but just don't be influenced by them. What else are we to do? Enjoy Christian freedom, decipher between idols, and be aware of sensitive, of offending weaker Christians. Now, when I say weaker Christians, I'm not talking about someone who's immature or maybe lacks knowledge, but they're just more sensitive about things. I'm not talking about snowflakes. You know, I'm offended. I need my safe space and get out my coloring books. I'm not talking about those snowflakes. I'm offended by what you do. For example... For example, if someone has a gambling addiction and has been 
struggling with gambling. In my previous church, we had a large gambling boat. Uh, I don't walk around in the boat because it might offend my brother and sister in Christ. And if I know someone who's an alcoholic and who suffers from alcoholic and there, there's damage done to their life, it'd be really rude and insensitive, even though I have the right to walk in any tavern and have them see me. Matter of fact, I won't even drink a beer around them or any alcohol around them. So what's a Christian to do? We have freedoms, right? We have freedoms. But then we need to be aware of those around us that I don't do anything to offend them. Maybe a friend died in it, it really hurts me, and a member just lost a parent who struggled with cancer for three years. It'd be really rude for me to say, well, think about my needs while I'm ignoring their needs. So we live in freedom, we love one another, be aware of weaker Christians, why I don't want to damage that person's soul. And finally, I'm just not going to explain to them why it's okay, but I'm going to build them up with love. Remember the children's message, the bigger items and the smaller items? It's okay for us to have the smaller items if it meant that the brother or sister in Christ I love can have the what? The bigger item. I don't need it. So what does this look like? Um, my previous church in November of 2013 uh, is a Sunday. Violent storms are supposed to come through about 4 in the afternoon, and it came through at about 11.30, which meant we moved this worship service at this time to our basement because no storms were coming through. And then after the service, we heard what was done. And F4 went through East Peoria, some of the communities, but mostly through Washington, Illinois, right next to us. Uh, five of my members totally lost their homes. Uh, two lives were ended by that, and 140 lives, I'm sorry, 140 homes were destroyed, as well as our Missouri Synod sister church. That got damaged, too, as well as the pastor's parsonage. And uh, let me say this. If you haven't been through an area ravaged by a tornado, they all look the same. Why? Because there's nothing. Whether it's Oklahoma City, Joplin, Missouri, Washington, Illinois, it all looks like nothing. Um, I remember uh, going there and helping out our sister congregation, and we came, some of our members came and helped clean up the area, that about two or three weeks after a tornado, uh, they opened up the streets, and there was like debris stacked up 20 feet high on either side of the road. Car grills and children's toys and mattresses almost looked like World War II. So there's a tornado, and everything is just leveled in Washington, Illinois. That happened on a Sunday. Now, this was going on the next Saturday, six days later. The Washington Panthers high school team was going to play Springfield Sacred Heart Catholic Cyclones in a Division V playoff game. Who are they going to play? The Cyclones. Students from Washington. Yeah. Wow. So what did Sacred Heart Catholic do? Well, the game was there. So all their cyclo names and all their cyclo illustrations and pictures in their stadium, they covered up with sheets. And they removed the cyclone decal from their helmets. And they refused to be called cyclones because that week everyone's a panther. And they sent like four buses filled with bottled water up to Washington. Did they have to do that? But it was pretty sensitive of them, wasn't it? Imagine going to sit in a football game with cyclones when someone's having a funeral, or like 13 team members don't have homes, and two coaches don't have homes. Joy, Jesus, others, yourself. True story, by the way, true story, okay? We don't need to be cyclones today with what happened. Boaz and Ruth, Ruth was a widow who was poor, and Boaz uh, picked his field. Does anyone know what it means to gleam a field? But when I went to Germany, and my uncle owned a potato farm, and before I got there, he picked up all the potatoes, and there were still little potatoes in the field. I used to ride my bike out, and people would come into his field with bags, and they'd pick up all the potatoes that weren't picked up with the potato pickup machine, whatever, okay? He didn't charge them for it, and neither did Boaz. Boaz said, Ruth, come glean my fields for free. He could have charged her. You know, $5 a pound, whatever, he didn't. Uh, Boaz took the smaller cup, not the bigger cup. Christian love for others. The 54th Massachusetts was the first African-American regiment in World War II, I mean, sorry, in the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln desired that 180,000 African-Americans would serve in the Civil War effort. So he raised troops. Many were former slaves. Many fought for freedom to end the bondage of slavery and to end discrimination. 
And there's a picture of that, that movie is shown in, in the movie Glory. I think it's 1989. And in that occurrence, the time came for them all to get paid. Now, the pay for an American soldier serving in the Civil War is $13 a month. Well, we have inflation. That's a lot of money. As a matter of fact, times that times 50. Um, however, white soldiers got $13 a month. African American soldiers, I use the term up there because that, that's how the movie referred to it. Um, African American soldiers received $10 a month. And the African American soldiers began to protest because bullets hit us just as well as they do white, white people. And when Colonel Robert Gould, um, Robert Gould Shaw saw it, he said, neither will us white soldiers accept that pay. And they took their grievance to Abraham Lincoln and he changed it. Could have been paid $13, dollars say, too bad for you, $10 an hour, we'll work on it. No, no one gets paid. And finally, most importantly, um, there is Peter. Now, when Peter betrayed Jesus, Jesus met with Peter individually and says, Peter, you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, you love me, take care of my lambs. Peter, you love me, take care of my sheep. Jesus reinstated Peter. Then, then Jesus looked at Peter and said, ready for this, Peter? Someday someone's going to take you where you don't want to go and someone's going to do to you what you don't want to have done to you. Now, legend has it that how did Peter die? Say it. Crucified how? Upside down. Now, if you listen to Dr. Paul Meyer, who's an expert in first century Palestine, Apparently, Peter was in Rome when the Christians were being persecuted, and the Christians got Peter out free, and he began walking away from the Colosseum. And about a mile or two down the road, thinking about supper, he said, that's not right for me. I'm the leader, and my brothers and sisters in Christ are being persecuted. So he willingly walked back in. He was crucified upside down in front of Caesar. Once again, he took the smaller cup and a smaller portion Joy, Jesus of his yourself. And so, can you all read this with me? The Christian. Brother, if having a beer offends you, who struggles from alcohol and maybe an alcoholic father, I will not drink a beer. And sister, if going to Vegas offends you, I will not do that. If something offends you, I will not do that for the sake of your faith. I'm willing to give up that right. If doing something, if being a cyclone is going to hurt you, whose community's been ravished, we will not do that. Being a Christian means I'll take the nickel, I'll take the dollar bill, I'll take the smaller cup, I'll take the smaller book. That's why. Why? Well, there you have it. Can you read it with me? For Christ. So Christ, who is God, who came down from heaven, emptied himself, and died for all of us, you and I, sinners, sometimes only one in the bigger, that we might be saved. He gave Jesus, others, yourself, friends in Christ, for Christ. So I'll say this, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom we live, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. And yes, Jesus, other yourself, because of his grace and power, working in us for getting redeemed. So, how about this for a closing thought? I think it'll wrap everything up together. Can you read it with me? A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And all God's people say...